In the last video I talked about the normal version of the central limit theorem but one drawback to that is that we need to know the population standard deviation SD of Y to use it. It's handy to have uh, an alternate version of the central limit theorem that we can apply when we don't know the population standard deviation which in practice we rarely do. So if we don't know the population standard deviation then it's reasonable to use the sample standard deviation to estimate it. So what happens to the central limit theorem if we do that? If we replace the population standard deviation that was in that theorem with a sample standard deviation? Well what happens then is that instead of having a normal distribution for the sampling distribution of the sample mean we end up with a t distribution and the t distribution is very like the normal distribution it has that same kind of bell shape but it's a little more spread out and one way that that's described is it has fatter tails and the reason that it has fatter tails is because by introducing the sample standard deviation as an estimate of the population standard deviation we're adding additional uncertainty to the procedure that we're doing and so to reflect that additional uncertainty we have to make the distribution a little bit wider since we're using a sample estimate for a population parameter then as usual with estimating population parameters we're going to get a better estimate if we have a larger sample size and so it makes sense that the sample size will have an impact on how much additional uncertainty we have to build into the procedure and so the way that the t distribution does this is it uses the sample size n and it calculates something called the degrees of freedom which in this case has the formula n minus 1 so just take the sample size subtract 1 that's your degrees of freedom and the degrees of freedom indexes the t distribution that you use and as the degrees of freedom becomes becomes larger and it will become larger for a larger sample size then the t distribution ends up looking more and more like a normal distribution conversely when the sample size is very small you get really fat tails and you have a lot of probability out in the tails so let's see how that all works so here's an example of some rows from a t-table and I've presented this the same way as when we looked at the normal table before and I'm going to focus on this middle row here where I've got degrees of freedom equal 29 and the reason degrees of freedom is 29 that's the row I'm interested in is because our sample of house prices we had a sample size of 30 and n minus 1 is 29 so this 1.311 here that's the the value along the horizontal axis uh, if we were to draw a picture of a, a, a t curve we would have 1.311 along the axis and if we looked at the area the tail area to the right of 1.311 under the t curve that upper tail area would be 0.1 if we go out a little further in the tail to 1.699 the tail area would only be 0 0.05 if we went all the way to 2.045 the tail area would be 0 0.025 and so on so you can see the idea that I mentioned in in the last slide when we have a, a, a smaller degrees of freedom a smaller sample our our tails are getting are getting fatter so what that means is we've got more probability 
out in the tail. Okay, so whereas to get a point 0.1 upper tail area with degrees of freedom equal 29, you only had to go to 1.311, you have to go out to 1.638 to get an upper tail area of, of 0.1 when the degrees of freedom is only 3. Conversely, when your sample size gets bigger, so say your sample size was 61, degrees of freedom equals 60, these, these critical values are getting smaller. And eventually, if you go all the way to infinity, you actually get a normal distribution. So these numbers here in this row are equivalent to the numbers that we saw in the, in the normal table before. So the way that we use the table is exactly the same as, as the way we used it before. The horizontal axis values are the critical values and the tail areas under the density curve represent probabilities. So for example, this statement here, the probability of a T distribution with 29 degrees of freedom being less than 1.699 is 0.95. That's coming from this value here in the table. Degrees of freedom 29 over here and upper tail area 0 0.05 up here. So if the upper tail area is 0 0.05, the area to the left would be 0.95. Okay, so that's this statement and then we've got the upper tail area in this statement. Two tail areas are along the bottom, so if I look at 1.699 and think about the probability to the to the right of 1.699 and to the left of minus 1.699 and add those two tails together I would get 0.1 down here. Okay so that's this statement down here. Okay so let's run through an example of how to use that t version of the central limit theorem. So now my assumptions are only that we're randomly sampling n values of y from a population with a mean of e of y. I'm not assuming a normal distribution and I'm not assuming a particular value for the standard deviation. Here's the central limit theorem. I'm standardizing again as I did before only this time I'm using the sample standard deviation down here in the denominator and if I use my sample standard deviation rather than assumed population standard deviation I don't get a, a z value I get a t statistic and that has a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom and that's written like this t with a subscript n minus 1 so let's use our home prices example and let's assume that we're sampling our home prices from a population with a mean of 280. We can calculate the sample standard deviation and let me show you that over in R over here. Oh incidentally you can replicate those numbers in the t table using the QT function here. See so these numbers were from that row in the table for 29 degrees of freedom. Uh, here's the calculation of the sample standard deviation 53.x8656 and then the question is what is the 95th percentile of the sample mean? So I start with the t-distribution expression probability t29 less than 1.699 is 0.95 and the 1.699 is is this number here okay the 95th percentile of a t distribution with 29 degrees of freedom and then I substitute what t 29 is using using this up here. Okay, so it's sample mean minus 
the population mean and that's coming from this assumption here and then divided by the sample standard deviation over square root of n and then I rearrange this by multiplying both sides by 53.8656 over root 30 and adding 280 so I isolate the sample mean on the left hand side of the inequality and that's what this expression is here so if I run that I get 296.71 or 297 rounded to the nearest whole number so the 95th percentile of the sample mean is $297,000. I'll just finish by running through one last example. Let's suppose instead of the 95th percentile we wanted the 90th percentile. So what would change? Well the only thing that would change here would be this number here, the 1.699. Instead it would be 1.311434. That's the 90th percentile. And then if I multiply that by the standard deviation divided by the square root of 30 plus 280, I get 292.8973 or $293,000 to the nearest $1,000. So the 90th percentile of the sample mean is $293,000. So that's uh, an example of calculations that we can do for the central limit theorem, the T version, and that's useful because it means we don't have to uh, make an assumption about the population standard deviation. Instead, we can use the sample standard deviation, which we can calculate. So next, in the next video, I'll go on to talk about how we can use this idea to calculate confidence intervals for the mean.